Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. Uh, today is a very cool episode because it is all about Keller shells. Um, and I'm joined by Justin Owen of Keller Products. Um, Justin, how are you? I am well. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's it's my pleasure, and um, it's really neat because this is a uh, an episode that was requested by a listener, and um, I just love it because there's, I think, there's basically endless possibilities of uh, historical uh, drum topics that we can talk about, so this, this fits right in. Sure, sure. And, you know, over its history, Keller Products has kind of been... Uh, you know, a quiet player in the industry. You yeah. know, it wasn't until you know, probably 15, 18 years ago that we really started uh, becoming more more public oriented. So there are some some misconceptions out there, and uh, the rumor mill, uh, you know, has some crazy ideas on how shells are made and how we produce them. So you know, we'd uh, be happy to clear some of that up. Um, but going back to the the beginning of the company. Um, it was uh, started by Robert Keller Sr. Uh, shortly after World War II, 1946, uh, with with some of his uh, buddies that had just gotten out of the army, and you know they were tossing around some ideas for working with wood, and and they started developing uh, methods for molding plywood into different shapes. Um, so that uh, through the late 40s, they did a lot of uh, military. Uh, applications, aircraft parts, glider parts, um, and then they got into uh, tubes uh, for military purposes like shipping bazooka rounds and stuff like that and wooden tubes because they were non-static. And then um, the round tubes kind of let it lent itself to to musical applications as people began to see them. So, um, you know, through the 50s, uh, we did most of the music stuff we did back then was uh, primarily like tambourines, uh, banjo resonator rims. Uh, I'm sure somebody was making drums out of them, but it it really wasn't something that, that they were focusing on at the time. It was more of a byproduct of, hmm. of what it was. Wow. So so it was born during the World War II era, not as drumming, but just as an essential like kind of wartime um, necessity for a multitude of basically cylindrical... Um, applications right and then it evolved into hey there might be a market yep. for drums yep and uh, you know there was uh, you know other things like glider parts uh you know molded plywood wing panels that were very light uh and structurally sound wow um, that's amazing architectural products you know over the over the course of the the years since 1946 we've manufactured virtually hundreds of different uh, plywood products. Um, for example, uh, in the uh, mid to late 60s, we were doing a lot of snowboards for Burton out really? of plywood. Oh, my gosh. You know, it was a very early snowboard. Um, hockey sticks were, were big for a long time. Uh, platform shoe heels in the, in the 1970s. Wow. Uh, we, used to, we used to load up railroad cars full of them. Uh, we had a railroad track right next to the factory the car would pull up we'd load them up full of shoe heels and, <laughs> Platform and send them shoes. out oh man that's yeah. uh i never ever would have guessed that that's pretty cool though yeah so you know eventually you know moving into the 60s you know the musical applications became uh, more prevalent um you know in the mid 60s 66 or so a gentleman from fender came in said, hey, I heard you guys are, are molding plywood and making round stuff, and this was uh, shortly after uh, CBS had acquired the Rogers Company, mm-hmm. and they were packing everything up and moving them to uh, Fullerton. Yeah. Um, as I understand it, they didn't want to you know, mess around with all the molds and machines. They just wanted to have somebody else make them. Uh, you know, so this gentleman came in. I don't, I don't know what his name was. That was a little bit before my time. Um, you know, he said, "Hey, I'm I'm looking for shell wood drum shells that that are you know made of maple, and from 10 inches to 26 inches in diameter, and if you can tool up for everything in between every couple of inches, you know, he says I'll give you an order for 50,000 shells." Oh boy! So that kind of got everybody's attention, and they went into high gear designing. Uh, tools and fixtures to, to start running all of those uh, diameters. 
And it really didn't take all that long, you know, within a, a matter of uh, four or four or five months, you know, they had tooled up and were, were starting to run production. So to back up, would, so was it Rogers who was the first person to begin using Keller as kind of outsourcing their shells? Um, commercially, yes. Okay. You know, there were, there were, you know, private builders and, and restoration people and tinkerers that were, that were using them. And of course, you know, there were guys, banjo builders and stuff that were using them and tambourine builders. Wow. Okay. Um, but the, you know, the really first big commercial push into a full range of, of, uh, drum sizes was, was with Rogers. Wow. Okay. That's great to know. Cause it kind of just seems like Keller's always been a, um, it's just always been there. I, I'm glad I, I'm glad we now know who the first person was. So that's wild. That's as far as my understanding of it goes. You know, the most of the old time crew, uh, you know, they've since passed on. I mean, I've, I've been with the company about 26 years. So in the in the longevity of it, you know, that's not a, a real long time. Yeah. So then pick it up there after we're you know we're we're working with. Rogers and um, it's beginning to look like, hey, this drum thing might be a uh, might be a viable option for for the business to to start working with. Sure, you know, and um, I don't believe we really had any kind of exclusivity agreement with Rogers. Um, you know, so as word kind of got around, um, you know, mostly through the seventies and then into the eighties. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of, uh, miscellaneous projects with, with other companies. Um, in the early eighties, Pearl had, um, was retooling their factory in Taiwan and they wanted to push into the U S market. Uh, you know, so they had us, uh, run, you know, what's, what's now known as their U S maple series, uh, mm -hmm. back in the eighties, you know, until they got tooled up and, and then they, you know, went back to make them themselves. Um, you know, and over the years, all the custom drum builders, you know, eventually word got around because it was a relatively small community, you know, at that time, there wasn't a whole lot of guys that were, uh, you know, building custom drums. It was, you know, you pretty much went to the music store and, and, you know, bought what you want. Yeah. But, you know, as, you know, Slingerland ended up, you know, dismantling their tooling, you know, then they came to us for, for shells, um, the other company in the country that was producing commercial shells, Jasper Wood Products, uh, they ended up closing their doors um, probably somewhere around uh, the early 2000s. You know, so we ended up we ended up picking up you know a lot of their customers. Yeah, so so Jasper would have been the big competitor because I know they were working with Gretsch early on and all this stuff. So that was kind of the uh, yep. the only other competitor at that point, right? Um, on a commercial level, yeah. Okay. yeah. You know, you you always have your tinkerers that are, sure. you know, building different types of shells, either steam bent shells or stave shells or segment shells. Uh, you know, but as far as commercial plywood, uh, molded plywood shells, uh, Jasper and Keller were, were pretty much the ones, you know, outside of companies that were just making them for their own use. Yes. You know, like Ludwig and, and Slingerland and, and uh, the like. Yeah, and I think that's where some of the, uh, I don't want to say confusion or debate comes up, is is this who is actually making their own shells. Um, I think that's where a lot of, like when I do some of these episodes, I get people saying, well, Gretsch wasn't making their own shells, and the guy didn't talk about that. And it's kind of a, um, I think when a company does make their own shells, it gives them a little bit, someone can say, oh, that's they're different, and they're their very own distinct sound because of that. Um which I'm sure different companies would maybe, would they then, well, let's say Pearl or Rogers, would they modify the um, shells at all after they after they got them to make them, dis like the bearing edges or anything, to make them distinctly Pearl at that time? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, you know, like Rogers, uh, you know, always had the, the speckled gray painted interiors. Yeah. Which I don't think it was so much a, a function of sound rather than, giving them a uniform look and not having to worry about, gee, this has a dark streak of wood in it, or, you know, this knot is visible, or that's not the most attractive seam. You know, they just painted it over and moved right on. Sure. Uh, I think people read into there being a, an acoustic benefit to it just because that added to its its uh, 
story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. But, you know, uh, these days and over the years, you know, we've always produced lots of different types of shells. There's, there's really not just one shell recipe. You know, we have, you know, some standards that, you know, are available to everyone. Uh, but we also have, you know, probably 40 or 50 proprietary shell designs that we only make available to a specific customer. Interesting. So, you know, to to for someone to say that a company, well, they don't make their own shells, so they can't, you know, tailor their own sound or they sound like everybody else. Um, not necessarily, you know, because uh, companies that that are running production and and have the the capacity to you know run those kind of numbers, you know, we're happy to to put together a proprietary shell and and run that just for them. Interesting. Wow. Okay, that's good to know because um, I mentioned to you before that I uh, I personally have a dark horse percussion kit that I got year I got probably in like 2012, and it was this big like yes, it's great. I've saved up a bunch of money, and um, yeah. And then you find out that a lot of the companies are using Keller shells, and it's just good to clear up that uh, maybe misconception that, that you're getting the same drum. Let's say in that boutique world that shine is the same as dark horse is the same as SJC is the same as it. It's interesting to hear that they are all sort of proprietary and in some cases and, and unique to that company. Yeah. And it, and it depends on, on the builder's perspective and, and their, uh, techniques, the hardware, you know, there's, uh, a lot of things that that are going to going to have an effect on the sound of the drum. You know, it's not not just the the shell composition, but the type of hardware, the heads, the tuning, the the bearing edges, the stick they're using, the room they're playing in. Uh, you know, and the the shells that we do make available to the general public. A lot of them are available through distributors. You know, there's a, enough of those out there so that, you know, people can develop their own blend of shell thicknesses. Some people like, you know, very thin shells on the tom, a little bit thicker on the on the floor tom and thicker yet on the bass drum and then a really thick snare. Yeah. We offer and manufacture enough different types that, you know, they can mix and match, you know, to whatever whatever fits their, their theory. Hmm. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, then let's let's back up here. So I think we left off uh, history wise. I believe you said Slingerland was that in the eighties ish area, or no? It was Pearl who was in the eighties. Um, where do we go yeah. from there? Yeah. And uh, as I recall, the you know the Slingerland uh, tooling was kind of mothballed in in the uh, early nineties. Yeah. And you know they made a few different runs at it. Um, you know, I think they were producing them in Nashville uh, for a while, uh, but they they just never really seemed to get their legs back under them like the the, the old days. Yeah. So then uh, after that, we were in the '90s. Um, was this a big booming period for Keller? Was the the name has always been there, but what was what was going on then? Well, starting in the in the '90s, that's that's um, early. That's when I uh, came on board. Was in the very early '90s. Um, you know, and I, myself, I, I really had no idea what Keller products on, you know, did, uh, just because it's such a nondescript place and, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a relatively large company in town, um, just because it's part of the Keller group of companies. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of five or six different divisions that do, um, everything from, um, translucent building systems uh, to solar uh, friendly buildings wow uh, uh, super span structure buildings um, interesting so, okay you know I just happened to walk in the back door one day and was looking for a job and then once they you know they, they said oh sure start tomorrow uh, you know and then I started saying well what, what are you using these things for you know and then we <laughs> started explaining it so I started um Spent a lot of time um, talking with different drum builders, you know, about what, you know, what their theories were, and and you know, it eventually uh, kind of morphed into me being able to better assist them, you know, develop their shells, you know, based on you know what they were looking for and and my knowledge of of what was available and and what we could do for them. 
Sure. Now let's let's pause here. Let me ask the question: Are you yourself a drummer? Not a very good one. <laughs> but you you are a drummer, though. So that that's good to know that there's you know there's. Drum- um, well, I'm I'm more of a design and builder. Got it. Okay. You know, I, I've been kind of tinkering and building them. Uh, you know, ever since about the third week I was here. Okay. Just because it kind of fascinated me. Um, but I, you know, I, I build, uh, you know, drums as kind of a little little thing on the side. Uh, but I also do furniture pieces and architectural pieces. You know, I'm not kind of limited to just that. If it's round and wood, you know, I've I've kind of got an interest in it. Gotcha. Yeah, it seems like that's the right place to be. I didn't know that that there was like a gr- Keller group creating all these different things. It's uh, is the drum group kind of the I know not in a bad way, but is it kind of the black sheep of the 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 divisions of uh, of Keller, where it's building, building, building um, drums. No, not really. It's it, it's really more the the founding company, and it was always the the uh, owner's kind of pet project. You know that. Yeah. You know, because his office was right in right in our building, and you know, and he was out on the floor on a regular basis, and and uh, Mr. Keller passed away and Mara Sr. passed away in 2012. Okay. And right up until uh, he was 98 years old, he was still in the office three days a week. Wow. You know, he was... uh, he, you know, he was a good good man to work for. You know, he was he was a fair but tough boss, as you know sure. many of that that era were. Yeah. Um, but he has four sons uh, that are all involved in the company. That's great. Uh, they kind of each head up their own division of of, of the different companies. Uh, and now the, you know there's grandchildren uh, involved and, and great grandchildren that are involved in the company. So it's still a, a very family oriented company. Uh, it's privately held. There's there's no uh, public uh, component to it. Interesting. That's I love when I hear drum. It's kind of like the Ludwigs and the well, not as much the Slingerlands, but it's it's a you know. And now that I think about it, not as much the Ludwigs. But at some point, a lot of these companies had family um, ties. But uh, okay, so then we the '90s. That's all happening. Um, there seems to be a point in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as you get into the um, as we mentioned, there's a big boom of those, these boutique drum brands coming out of the woodwork, like Truth and all these different companies who I think relied a lot on Keller as a, um, it lowered the threshold of, I want to start a drum company, but I don't know how to make my own shells. Sure. They, it's almost like you guys took the hard part out. Was that, when did that happen? Don't let me skip anything. If, if in the 2000s stuff happened. Yeah, no, um, you know, probably... Yeah, right around the early 2000s, we started to become a little bit more uh, marketing focused and, you know, okay, how can we, you know, start, uh, you know, running more production numbers and, uh, you know, so we started a marketing campaign. The decision was made to sort of step out of the shadows a little bit. So, you know, we started um, um, having a a booth at the NAMM show in, uh, in Nashville and then L.A., uh, so we did that for a number of years, you know, so that, that helped, you know, bring the, the brand awareness. Sure. Um, you know, sure. but we were still, we were still just a component manufacturer. We know mm-hmm. we don't, we don't build finished drums. Uh, you know, we don't really do any finishing or drilling. Um, you know, we can, we can do bearing edges, you know, if somebody really needs us to, to do it, like on, you know, something that comes out of our eBay store. Yeah. Um, but as far as the production shells are concerned, you know, they're just raw square cut shells to their specs and out the door they go. But yeah, in the mid 2000s up through, you know, even um, into the 2010s, uh, you know, there were there was a really big boom of of custom drum builders, and you know, part of it I think was was related to the, the financial recession. You know, a lot of people got laid off. They got you know a, a, a payout. You know, either their four hundred one k or a retirement or whatever. Yeah. And they said, geez, you know, what's what's a company that I can start that you know really takes a, a relatively low startup cost? Mm-hmm. You know, which building drums. You know, to to do it, it doesn't take a, a you know a huge shop. You know, you can do it in your garage, yeah. And then you know, work into it slowly by adding you know more and more tools. But I think your initial startup cost is relatively low. So we did see a you know a lot of guys um, and gals come out you know doing that. 
Who do you think was the first company to do that, to be the one who says, hey, we're going to be this, probably came from NAM or some sort of show. Who was the one who, was, who sticks out in your mind as being an early leader in the, the custom boutique drum companies? Um, well, I think it, it kind of it goes down to uh, uh, Joe Montaneri was uh, certainly one of the earlier guys that, that was really getting into the custom uh, fabrication and design and all of that. And uh, I've known known Joe for many, many, many years. And uh, he actually uh, came and worked uh, with Keller for, for several years um, with me in doing product development. Wow. Cool. Yeah, Rob uh, Campa from uh, Magstar Custom Drums, uh, currently the owner of World Max USA, uh, was instrumental in the early the early years, uh, as a basically as a sounding board for new shell designs, and and uh, always had great input. And you know, we'd send stuff down to him to try out, and he'd give us a yay or an a, or we're on the right track, or no, that's that isn't isn't going to cut it. Um, and then uh, you know, um, Bill Dedimore at Pork Pie. You know, he's been in, he's been in the game a long time. Yes, uh, doing very well. Sweetheart of a guy. Um, the guys at, at uh, GMS, uh, Farmingdale, New York. They were they were in kind of early in the game. Uh, a fellow named Dale Flanagan out at Fortune Drums. Yeah, uh, he's still around. Cool. Uh, another fellow named Paul Blyfus. Um, uh, he out of the San Diego area. Uh, he passed away a number of years ago, but he was another one that uh, you know that I talked with regularly. And of course, uh, John Good yeah. at uh, DW, you know, uh, really kind of helped further the interest in in drum construction and and you know manipulating woods and, and uh, plies. So, sure. Now I always thought uh, I always thought John Good. Now DW though they make for like their signature custom stuff they make their own shells correct i'm sure they have some lines that are they do now okay but early on they did they do now but oh no they we did we did all their all their shells for them wow okay cool that's good to know yeah, right just up through the right up through the late 90s okay and then it you know it just kind of uh, tapered off as they you know began to tool up and, and start producing their their own shells now, is that a common theme where people almost use you guys as like a starting point and then they get uh, legitimized enough to then um, maybe venture into building their own because they've then got the, the backing or let's say the, the funding to do that? In some cases, um, I would say it's the exception uh, rather than the rule. Okay. Because, you know, jumping into into that portion of manufacturing, you know, is it's it, it's difficult and it's extensive and it's rather complex. You know, there's there's oh, yeah. a, a big financial part to it and and uh, not everybody is prepared to you know to prepare to take that step. So many of them are, are happy to just say, hey, I don't need to mess with that part of it. They're making me what I want. It's how I want. You know? Yeah. Now my um my thought here is is that I again sometimes as a as a buyer of someone who for a four piece drum set about two thousand dollars for a custom boutique brand those are pretty good margins for a drum company to sell to to be sourcing the shells sourcing the hardware putting them all together obviously putting the wrap on doing all that stuff but that's a really good margin there. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that, on the actual price of the finished product that goes out to people versus what they're paying to you guys? Um, well, you know, it really depends on the, you know, on the, on the finish, really. I mean, because you can, you can get into, you know, doing spray finishes, you know, where the finish alone is, you know, upwards of $200 a gallon. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and then you may, you may have hours into, into uh, wet sanding and polishing, depending on how good you are at spraying. Sure. Uh, myself, I'm not very good at spraying, so I end up doing a lot of wet sanding and polishing. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the number of hours that, you know, uh, that can be involved, you know, can be pretty hefty. And, and, you know, if you're putting together that whole kit and you've got, say, $600 worth of, of materials and, and hardware, you know, and another 
40 or 50 hours of, of spraying and, and assembly, it's two thousand dollars doesn't you know it makes for a pretty thin hourly wage <laughs> yeah, yeah you've okay you've convinced me i'm i'm now uh i'm now happy with my drum set you know and even <laughs> you know even even uh you know the wrapped uh yeah. kits assuming it's a you know a quality you know like a del mar original del mar wrap sure you know that, that stuff's uh expensive per square foot Okay. You know, so you know that ends up, you, yeah. You save some time on the on the finishing and polishing, but you, you end up, uh, you know, paying more, uh, you know, for for your materials. I think, like you said, that can be kind of a misconception of because a company would be using Keller shells, it doesn't mean that it's worth as much as a company making their own shells. Uh, I don't want to say worth as much, but it would be cheaper to manufacture when maybe, as you said, that's that's not exactly the case. No, 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 it's not. Okay. I said many, many, many of the companies, in fact, the vast majority of them are happy to just place the order for the shells, get all the shells in, and, and not have to worry about all the woodworking part of it and the dust collection and, and you know, all the headaches associated with a whole new, uh, different type of manufacturing in addition to the manufacturing you're already doing to, you know, to make them into finished drums. Yeah, I think delegating the power and that that goes back to Gretsch and all these companies is saying and Leedy is like, just because you can make it and you can have a, you know, three city block factory, that doesn't mean that uh, with the margins and logistics that that's even the best case you might be hurting yourself. Um, so you guys obviously know what you're doing. Yep, so in some cases, yeah. Okay, so then um, into the 2010s when there was the boom of boutique stuff, that kind of takes us from from then. I guess because we're currently in the 2010s, technically. What's happening now? What, what's going on with Keller uh, from that point up until today? Um, well, you know, we can we can kind of pause at the you know 2007, 2008, 2009. You know, when uh, the economy really kind of took a turn. Yeah. So you know, over the years, um, you know, we've manufactured a variety of products. So. Uh, that's really helped us to kind of weather the storms, you know, if, you know, uh, historically through much of our history, it was about 30%, 40% furniture goods, another, you know, 20 or 30% architectural components. And then, you know, the balance was the musical shells. When the economy took a turn, you know, all of a sudden the furniture side dropped way off, but the musical side shot way up uh, because you know now we've got all the these boutique builders and um, other companies that were sort of restructuring, saying, "Hey, you know, the manufacturing these things in house is is just not financially viable for us. Let's outsource them." So even though the the furniture uh, product and revenue dropped way off, you know, it shot up on the other side. Um, so, you know, that kind of helped keep things, you know, at a at an even keel, you know, manufacturing yeah. wise, you know, the shop was still busy and and they're still uh they're still busy right now. Yeah. But it's kind of leveled out since then. You know, it's uh music is has uh kind of stayed steady at about 65 to 70% of our production. You know, furniture kind of goes up and down. Um and store fixtures, you know, that it kind of dropped right off. Sure, yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, it's it's kind of a, I don't want to say recession-proof business because you have so many categories and you guys are, I think there's always a place for, for master woodworking and uh, manufacturing. So that's great. So so then that kind of takes us up to now. Where you, So it, would you say at this point it's still just business as usual, chugging along, people ordering shells and, and working with... Uh, the drum brands and all that good stuff. Sure. Yep. Yep. And we're, uh, you know, we're always developing, uh, new shell recipes, uh, for companies and, you know, they, they have new ideas and, and we toss them around and we do some prototypes and, and they, uh, say, yeah, we're close. We need to add a little more of this or take away some of that, or we need something out of it. What's your suggestion? Uh, so, you know, just like any uh, product launch, we'll we'll go through more prototypes, and then, uh, you know, we get the blessing and say, okay, let's let's run them. 
Wow, that's awesome. And I, I do love, um, I think it was probably 2012, I think I ordered a uh, Keller shell, like a, like a snare kit from, I believe it was Drum Supply House um, in Nashville. Yep. And sure. getting the shell, I obviously opted first one I ever did, having, they did it where they drilled the holes, they had the bearing edges, and it was just to kind of choose your hardware, put it together stain it. It was so much fun. I still have it. I love the drum. Um, it did make me appreciate the uh, art that goes into really creating a finished, let's say, branded real drum set, because um, it's not as easy to get everything uh, like 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 the screws on mine. If I play it for, you know, two months, the, the screw ends up falling out in the snare because I didn't use a pneumatic drill or something. Yeah. And so you find out those little things, but that's just a cool thing for people to do. And, and obviously you guys have that where you can, on your eBay store and all that things, you can build your own complete Keller drum set. And I mean, sure. I even remember making up a little badge that I never printed because that was a whole other thing. And, and thinking, oh, I'm going to start a drum company. Of course I didn't. I'm now doing a podcast, but, um, it's just a very fun, and you guys you guys allow people to to fulfill their their drum dreams. Yeah, it, it certainly it gives you a, a better appreciation of of what it takes to you know to put together an instrument uh, like that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's a it's a lot of work. It is a know? lot of work. Um, the uh, boutique builders, you know, they uh, you know it, it's it's tough to make ends meet you know you need to work the kinks out and you need to move them through quick but you know you can't you can't move them through so quick that you're sacrificing uh you know your quality and uh, you can always run down to a guitar center or whatever and pick up a an import kit for you know for half the money so yeah. they've uh definitely got to maintain their their edge and and uh and their quality and and the the sound uh, sure. Yeah. You know, that their customers have come to rely on, so they rely on us for that, and uh, and we do our best to uh, to keep it steady for them. That's great. Now, now let me ask you, going way back, beginning of time, Mr. Keller, um, are there any interesting stories that you know that have been passed down of just kind of like um, there was a big problem with distribution and Rogers got really angry and blah blah blah? What anything anything off the top of your mind? Some cool uh, old Keller stories. Um. Not really. We've we we've, we've had a a couple of uh, minor factory incidents where things got a little overheated and <laughs> and uh, you know we had to break out the extinguishers. But, <laughs> a lot of wood. Uh, you know, Miss, Mr. Keller was uh, you know he was he was a, a famously even keeled person. You know, I don't think I I've ever I'd ever seen him angry. You know, if if there was something bothering him, he'd basically just close his door, and then he'd be out in a little while, and and uh, and he'd work through it. And you know, he he was always one to go out on the floor and and acknowledge that you were doing a good job for him, and he's happy to see things. You know, those trucks getting loaded up and and heading out. And uh, no, he's a, he's a, a very nice man to work for. That's great. I mean, I'm the one thing that I, I absolutely love in, in all of these, and I think people who listen to the show know, is the that period of um, the World War II kind of, of era with all this. And it's just cool to know that Keller was around, albeit they might not have been making drum shells that early on. But there was a lot of growth and development and uh, like that the necessity to create things. Um, it's just great to then put Keller in that same era of, uh, sure. Being born in that time. Yeah. And you know, for the guys that were working here, you know, I mean, when I, when I first started here, there were several of the original founding guys that, you know, were eh, basically, you know, just about ready to retire. Um, but you know, even they would come into the shop, you know, a couple, three days a week, right, you know, into their 70s and 80s, you know, so it was always fascinating uh, talking with them and, you know, and of course, knowing what I knew at that point, you know, I'd say, well, how did you ever come up with being able to do this, you know, without any direction, you know, just kind of making it up as you go along. Uh, so it was fascinating to listen to them and, 
and they were, you know, they were some tremendously smart, uh, gifted guys that, you know, had vision. They, they had ideas, and Mr. Keller gave them the latitude to, you know, to run with those ideas and basically create something out of nothing. Yeah. You know, so it, it was always fascinating talking with the, you know, with any of the original guys. Yeah. You know, he had a very, very loyal circle of guys. Um, you know, you have always have employees that come and go, but his, the core circle pretty much remained uh, there throughout the, the life of the company, you know, until they were ready to retire. Wow. You know, it's a good company. And, and that also seems true with uh, a lot of drum companies is these these core guys who were there during the, you know, the the, bu- the building and the growth of the company and they stay around and uh, until the, the very last, you know, minute that they can. So now at the company, is it are in the, let's say in the drum division, is it a lot of drummers who work there or is it like yourself where it's people who drum a little bit, but really enjoy the, the manufacturing and the working with wood more than let's say I'm a drummer. Uh, we've over the years, we've, we've had some drummers, um, but it's been my experience that they would rather drum than, uh, than build shells. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of dusty and it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit nasty. And there's a, certainly an element of danger, uh, going on with all the pressures and the machines and the saw blades and swinging things and rotating things. Um, but, you know, having, you know, I, I would classify most of them as, you know, more woodworkers okay. than musicians. Okay. That's good to know. You know, we have cabinet shop guys that have made the transition and, uh, custom fabricators that, you know, uh, like the, the prospect of a stable company and, uh, you know, the yeah. <laughs> showing up at the same place day after day and, and having a paycheck every week and the stability of it. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's always been a good company to work for, you know, the, the sons and the grandsons and, and all of that there. They, they share a lot of their uh, fathers and grandfathers uh, work ethic. And, and uh, you know, so it, it was a pretty easy transition uh, over to the, you know, the next generations of, in the family. That's great. Now, kind of wrapping up here, I want to ask you one question and we can keep it brief and, and keep it interesting without getting too detailed. But um, from sure. from tree to someone's basement playing the drums. Can you just kind of briefly take us through what that process looks like in actually creating a drum shell without giving away secrets and all that stuff? But, you know, what is that process? Um, well, we work directly with the, with the lumber mills. Uh, we don't slice veneer ourselves. Uh, that, should, that is a whole other industry and, and manufacturing operation uh, in and of itself. Um, you know, but for, you know, let's say if we narrowed it down to our 50 most popular uh, shell types, you know, there's a variety of woods involved. There's a variety of, of uh, veneer cuts. Mm-hmm. Some of it's plain sliced. Some of it's um, rotary sliced. Uh, some of it's quarter cut. You know, so each of those different cuts is, a, is basically a different part of the mill or in, in some cases a different mill altogether. So... The, the trees get cut down, they get sent to the mill, uh, they get prepped for processing. Um, trees that are, that are going to be cut into veneer uh, need to be soaked and waterlogged. And then, uh, you know, rotary cut veneer is probably the one we go through the most of. Um, so basically the tree goes up onto a machine, a big blade comes into it, it peels it off like a paper towel roll, and it, it happens very fast. You know, it goes, and it's done. Wow. And then they cut it to, they pre-cut it to sizes that, that we've asked them to. It gets dried, packaged up, uh, and sent to our factory. And then we take it as single ply veneers and and um, you know do some lamination work with it. Uh, that part we really can't go into too much sure. detail yeah. on. Uh, but you know we prep it, you know, to make it manufacturable and uh, stabilize it uh, for storage. So we'll we'll run a lot of it, and then we'll you know we keep it in a, a climate controlled area so that it you know it'll remain stable on the shelf until we're we're ready to continue processing it. Then the shells get formed; they get uh, made to whatever recipe uh, the customer needs, or uh, to replenish our distributors uh, and resellers' stock. Wow, that's awesome! 
So then after that, you end up with a drum shell, and I'm sure you guys have a like a warehouse just full of them that are waiting to go out and uh, be turned into drums for all of us to play. Sure. Yeah. As they you know they move through the the factory, they we try and keep them in a orderly path so that you know they're they're they start in one area and they continuously head towards the shipping area. But as they get produced, they get staged in, in the warehouse and. Uh, marked off and checked and rechecked and uh, once they get the final uh, initials that the order is complete then then uh, our shippers go to work and package them up and figure out the best way to get them you know all nested inside one of another yeah. you know in skids and um, you know the type of drums you know cover spans everything from your your standard rock and roll uh, drum sets and, and jazz sets to um, Native American hand drums, uh, you know, are are a, a good portion of our business. Wow, I didn't uh, know that. Days. So, uh, banjo resonators, um, clock frames. Some people use musical shells for for clock frames or picture frames. Hmm. If it's uh, if it's round and wood, they they find a way to use a drum for it. <laughs> yeah, really, because it's not an easy thing to actually get that perfectly round. Uh... Um, cylinder that that is going to keep its shape, and as we know through history, with the use of reinforcement rings and the Gretsch is guaranteed sure. and not warp and all this stuff, that it's not a, I mean, it's trial and error. I'm sure over um, a lot of time to end up where we are today, which is just so cool. So, Justin, um, why don't you? I think now is a perfect time to tell people where they can look more into Keller shells, where they can find out how to order their own shells, and you know. All that good stuff. Sure. Well, uh, KellerShells.com uh, has links to our distributors and our uh, eBay stores and other direct sales programs. Um, you know, we we do we count on our distributors uh, heavily to you know to handle the the smaller single shell orders. And uh, as you experienced, you know, most of them they can they can bring the shell up to whatever level you need them to. Some people aren't ready to do layout and drilling, in which case um, most of them will do that for you. You know, it's sort of an a la carte uh, package. You you can buy the shell and the hardware or just the shell, or you can buy the shell pre-drilled and edged and snare beds, and then you do the finishing and assembly. So it's really, uh, we try to make it available to uh, anyone that wants to build a drum at whatever level they're they're ready to give it a shot at. That's great. I mean, it is a it's a fun experience to put together uh, a drum, albeit the hard part is done by Keller. So we can just have fun and like stain it, get a wrap, all that stuff. It's kind of daunting to even drill the holes, at least for me, a guy who's not that handy with my, uh, you know, drum making skills. But um, it is an absolute blast. And I think I can speak for everyone in the drum community that says that they have a lot of respect for Keller for doing what they do and uh, being an absolute, you know, essential part of, of drum history. So just a big thank you from, you know, to everyone at Keller. Yes, fabulous. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, you know, the, the doing, building your own drums, it, it, the one thing I see is it often leads to a little bit of an addiction problem with... Got to build another one. Got to build another one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm. There's something about drums that I guess if you got to be addicted to something, uh, drums is the is the you know the least of many evils. So I know I'm addicted. That's yeah, for sure. and you know I've I've over the years I, I you know I've I've mentored uh, some local uh, builders and kind of brought them along and gave them all the the benefit of my trial and error uh, experience and I think probably their their proudest moment is when they're at their first gig or second gig and somebody comes up and says, wow, those are great drums. You know, where'd you get those? And then they say, well, I built them. And they're like, are you kidding me? Yeah. So it is, it's sort of a proud papa moment, uh, you know, that I think every everybody that's built a drum uh, goes through, you know, in the, in the early stages. Absolutely. That's a... Such a good point, just because if someone comes up, you you assume that that drum is made by Pearl or that that drum is made by DW, not by yourself in sure. your basement, and then you can take it out and you can use it and do whatever you want with it. So that's that's a perfect uh, that's a perfect way to wrap it up. 
Justin, I really appreciate you All being right. on the show, and I'm glad we can uh, share some knowledge about uh, about Keller that, that does have a little bit of a, a – um, I feel like you guys keep your head down and do your work, and you stay out of the limelight a little bit, um, and you let – other people have the all the credit, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that's true. Um, one other um, misconception I, that I think I probably I don't see it so much anymore, but it it, w- it was around a lot in the drum forum days. Uh, we do make the shells individually, piece by piece, by hand. There's, there's not this big machine that just spits out a continuous tube that we keep chopping off pieces <laughs> of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Because, well, we, we do, and I, I, I kind of understand where that rumor came from, because we do have a plastic profile extrusion uh, division that is also part of the Keller Products division. And up there, yes, the plastic parts come out in a continuous stream, and we cut them off into little pieces. But but it, that's not, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the with the plywood division. Wow. No, so they're handmade shells. That's, um, that is good to know. Yes. Every, everyone is made by hand, one by one. Do you guys make acrylic shells at all? I know that's like a completely different, you know, type of no. drone. No? Okay. No. Nope. No, just uh, plywood. We really don't get into... Uh, steam bending or or stave shells or or anything like that. It's it's limited to to lots of different types of of plywood. Well, you know what you're good at, and you stick to it. So, Justin, this has been great, man. I uh, really appreciate you being on the show, and um, and again, keep up the great work. And I uh, I hope that Keller is around for a long, long time to come, and uh, we can keep on enjoying all of the Keller products. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Justin. We'll see you later. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.